Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And no, there is not town meeting coming up. And I can assure you, because John Odom, our city clerk, is sitting next to me. But we're going to talk about elections that are coming up. We're going to talk about August. We're going to talk about November. We're going to talk about voting, which is way in the news these days. And in this area, John really is the authority. So, John Odom, thank you for coming and visiting us tonight on a July night. My pleasure. Don't oversell me here. I don't want to let you down. <laughs> what does what's the city clerk do besides elections? You issue uh, marriage licenses. Oh, marriage licenses, vital records. What are uh, vital records? Uh, birth certificates, death certificates, uh, marriage certificates. We license dogs. We license businesses. Uh, You've also we, got the the room with all the property records. Yep, yep. That's the probably the biggest single thing we do is is the you know repository for the official record of of property. Um, dealings, transfers, mortgages, liens, that kind of thing. Those come in every day and that has to be available. Um, How has COVID affected that? Well, um, quite a bit. Uh, when all this first started and everybody shut down, we shut down too. In fact, my office was the first one to start shutting down and we would only make ourselves available uh, for title searches, for access to those land records by appointment. But even then, we managed to limit the number of appointments we had quite a bit because we have a pretty robust online system that enables folks to access that information remotely. And occasionally, when they would need other information, folks would email or, or phone us so we could get that stuff to them, get it scanned to them, rather than have people come in. I think there were only a couple times. Well, it's a fairly tight room to start with. It's, it, is, it is tight. And in the last few weeks, um, before... Before the general building opened up, we started opening up two days a week, two people at a time at most in two hour blocks to come in. We could, they could keep the distance that way. We had a whole new traffic flow that kept them out of the middle of the office where some of the folks who work there who might be vulnerable um, could be protected. Everybody had to have a mask. We'd spray everything down afterwards. So we're still basically doing that, except that now Tuesdays and Thursdays, we are allowing for walk-ins with the understanding that if you get there and you're the third researcher, you're out of luck, you'll have to come back later. But rarely have we ever had more than two at a time. So it's worked pretty well. Now, during the shutdown, uh, we would pay our water bill in the back, mm -hmm. in the drop slot. Can we pay our water bill in the uh, clerk's office these days? You can walk in. There's X's on the floor, so don't get closer. Um, and it looks like a check cashing place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so walk-ins again Tuesday and Thursday, which is when the general building is open. Um, we're still encouraging people not to. You know, use the Dropbox, use the mail. Most people send them in by mail. We have more and more people who have a you know automatically debited from their account. So. You know, we're, we are there for that, and we don't see much of that traffic because I think most people have gotten that message and they're using one of these other three ways to get it uh, to what, us. What's the recent automation that you guys have done? Uh, you've been working on it for a few years in terms of automating your system. Uh, can we pay for dog tags online? Renewals, yeah, but not new ones. Um, just recently tried to launch a... Um, uh, uh, an online system for working through uh, business licenses, and that kind of fell apart in my lap. So we'll try that again next year. <laughs> but other than that, uh, that's automated. Um, as I say, the land record access is is pretty much all automated. We're finally uh, here in the next week or two. We'll have all of the surveys digitized, and they should be available remotely. That's new. Um, so you know, there's always. Always something. That needs Is there anything to be. new on the city clerk site? Um, you, well, you mean other than the the land records? Right, other than the land records. Is there an area that that you've been working on? Well, right now it's all elections, elections, elections. Uh, especially with the new, um, just the new dynamics, everything going on. We're in uncharted territory uh, with the August election coming up, and it's made for some interesting. It's made it very difficult to plan. Let's put it that way. The August election is actually the, the reason that you're sitting next to me right now. Um, it's been an evolving process. Explain to us, what was the fight at the State House about? It, it just seemed like 
it seemed like the Lilliputians talking about cracking one side of the egg versus the other. Well, and thankfully, it didn't turn out to be much of a fight at the end anyways. Um, now, what were the, Governor Scott had a side, the legislature had a side. Could you explain what those two sides were and why they were hanging to those two sides? Well, there was actually a lot more agreement than disagreement, as I understand. There were just a couple big points of disagreement. Um, the legislature was largely taking its cues from the recommendations of Secretary of State Condos. Um, you know, we didn't know where we were going to be in August or November in terms of, you know, social distancing, large gatherings, and we didn't have time to sit and feel it out. So there was, I think, universal understanding that we're going to have to be able to do things differently. We're going to have to be able to make changes fairly nimbly. Um, the point of disagreement between the legislature and Secretary of State Condos on one side and the governor on the other was that um, the issue of going to a full mail-in ballot election in November. Okay, what is the difference between a mail-in ballot and an absentee ballot? Um, well, absentee is just a word we use less and less these days because the implication is that you have to have a reason to request a mail-in ballot. That's why we, we usually talk about early ballots now, but that word absentee is stuck in people's brains, so you know, absentee early ballots. So, you know, you now, can... Now, we, we've been doing absentee ballots seemingly forever, haven't mm -hmm. we? Absolutely. They've been, it's been a, you know, each state has different rules for doing it, and um, Vermont is uh, what we would call when I was in my little election administrator geek school there, uh, a democracy canon state where we really, our, our default is to give the benefit of the doubt to the voter. You know, the idea is we want to make as many people participating in the process as possible, so our procedures, including early voting, tend to be very open, very encouraging, very easy, as opposed to some other states where they may actively incur discourage that. And that includes when I get my driver's license and register to vote. Yes, and that's also, Vermont has, has done a lot of cool cutting edge stuff with the election process. Not only do we have that robust early ballot piece, we have automatic voter registration, which I think only 11 other states do, where you know it used to be when you go in and get your driver's license uh, renewed or you get your first one, you can opt in to be registered to vote. Now it's automatic, so if you opt, if you check in the box, you're opting out. So it means we get more people on the rolls, but even better than that, it means that we in the clerk's offices are constantly getting rolling updates from the DMV when somebody goes and renews their license. So a lot of these address changes, they're traditionally hard for us to capture. Uh, they come rolling in now. Somebody goes and gets a new license. How often they have a do new I address. get a new license? I mean, it's every a, four every year. couple, two to four years, depending yeah. on on how you do it. So that, but for a lot of folks, I, I get mine every two years. I don't know why. I think I'm just feeling too cheap when I go in, and I don't <laughs> want to give them as little money as possible. But then every couple of years, we're getting address changes that we weren't getting otherwise until somebody decides maybe they want to come in and vote on a town meeting day and maybe they haven't voted on town meeting day in a few years and they find out they've got a few years old address on there. So what was the governor's position? Oh, yes, sorry, we got off track with that. Um, the governor was just uncomfortable with the idea of, of a, of a full-on mail-in election, which is how Oregon does it, Washington does it, Colorado, where they have lists of all the registered voters everybody gets sent a ballot. And you can... Now, he wanted a notification that you could get a ballot? Was well, this is, this is phase one. And I, there was... In fact, I got a, we got postcards. You got postcards. So this, is, this was step one. And this there seemed to be broad agreement on. There was a Secretary of State sent out a um, postcard to every registered voter with their local clerk's contact information which was a reminder, an encouragement to vote early, and a little form they could fill out and send back. There's a million ways you can request an early ballot already, but this was to encourage it, to make it easier, to, to you know, reassure people that they can vote, even if they're worried about coming out. You don't have to come out and do a big crowd on Election Day. And the response has been tremendous. And this, so this has become step one, and then step two 
if the secretary of state has their way is you don't even have to request it everybody gets an early ballot um, but that means that means a lot of things that means we have to make sure our lists are tighter than ever um, our system for checking in tighter ballots. in what sense well you know there's always going to be folks on any voter list who, who are dead um, there's probably going to be a few people who are dead um, just because of the, how those things get updated people and when. who've left People, the state? That's the big thing. People who've left town and their registration may not have changed yet because if they don't let you know or they don't, or the state they go to doesn't let you know, if you re-register in, in Vermont, from Vermont to Vermont, it's automatic. If I So if you move to Chittenden County, as soon as your you, social security number will mesh or something on well, that Well, it's one? your driver's license. Oh, okay. Um, and then the backup is the last four of your social security. But yes, you have that singular record. So if you move to Burlington tomorrow and register to vote in Burlington, you're automatically off the rolls in Montpelier. So it's all very clean within, outside of state. Um, you have to wait for notification from the other state, but they're working on that too. That's improving dramatically through a... How so? There is a growing um, network um, called ERIC, I believe. Uh, which has now got about half the states involved where the different states are electronically transferring information for uh, voters who've moved and were previously registered in another state. This stuff is tricky because there's obviously going to be security issues. You don't want to link everybody up into one big network because, in, you know, the weakest link. So they, but they're very smart about how they do it, um, and it's proven beneficial. I, Vermont is going to be in that. I don't know if they are already. I should know that, but it's a it's a great system to get away from some of these concerns about somebody going and registering out of state, and we don't hear about it. We received the postcard for my wife and one for myself. Mm -hmm. What happened if those were rejected and turned back to the Secretary of State? Well, the bounces all come to us, and that has been great because now we get a bunch of bounces coming to us people who aren't there, you know, forwarding orders expired, things like that. And that gives me a big stack of returns so that I can go into each of those voter records and, and um, tag them as challenged, which means we have reason to believe that this person no longer lives here, but they have to wait two election cycles before they can be formally purged. Now, that doesn't mean those people don't get to vote. It means if they show up, or they contact us and we say, you've been challenged. They just need to sign a little affidavit that basically says, no, I swear I really do still live at this address. That's, you know, it's an oath. We make it easier. Perjury attaches. And then we give them their ballot. Now, if they were to try to be sneaky and get their early ballot, say, you know, today, and then run off and go and move to Burlington and register there and try to get another ballot, the same record. It follows them. So the Burlington clerk could register them there, but then if they tried to give them a ballot, he would be beep, 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 this person's already voted. We have a primary coming up mm -hmm. on what date? 11th. Which is Tuesday. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday ele the 11th, we have a primary. When did voting commence for that primary? I don't know. It feels like it's been going on forever. Um, I don't know. How long? Several weeks back. It's been going on for a while. Now, how long have you been city clerk? Oh, um, starting to head towards nine years. Have you seen mail-in ballots increase as a percent? Well, before all this, they, it was interesting. They were on this steady increase. We had a spike, and then they dropped again, which made no sense at all, and they've been creeping back up since. Now, this time around, the, like I say, the rules are completely different. It's a whole new ball game. We are going to end up with more than quadruple the early ballot requests that we had for the previous August primary. Now, I got that postcard in the mail. What is the process for me to actually get an early mail-in ballot? Well, the easiest thing if you get that card is to fill out the card and drop it in the mail to us. And if I threw out the card, what, what's the you can, process? Uh, you can give us a call. You can stop by. What are your hours? Is 8 it to only 4 Tuesday? 30. Well, so we're, we're in the office 8 to 4.30. For, for in-person, 
Yeah, Tuesday and Thursday you'd have to come by. But you're but in you the office eight to yeah. four thirty. You can and request it online through the Secretary of State's uh, webpage. Um, they, we make it as easy on you as we can. And a ballot will come to me. Yes. Uh, I want. I fill out the ballot. At, at this is a primary election. Do I have to say whether I want the Republican or the Democrat or the Progressive primary ballot? Well, this is our weird, crazy election, right? Um, you know the regular, your traditional election, one ballot, fill it out, put it in the machine, have a wonderful day. Um, even when we have the presidential primary, you go up and you say, I want the Republican ballot, I want the Democratic ballot. Well, for the statewide primary, it's very important to people that no one know which party you've, you've voted on, which of the three major parties, you know, Democratic, Republican, or progressive. So what you do is you get sent all three ballots with two envelopes, and a little instruction sheet on one of the envelopes. What you're supposed to do is you pick the one ballot, the one party ballot you want to vote on. You fill that out, you put it in one envelope, fill it out, sign it with your signature. The two rejects that you don't vote on go into a separate unvoted envelope, and both envelopes come back to us. What if I don't, what if I, I don't pay attention and I don't send back the unvoted envelope? Then your ballot will not be counted. Say that again Your for ballot, everyone, it, please. It is, it is considered um, a, a incomplete ballot. It's, a, it's an incomplete ballot, basically. It's a re, we have to reject it, which is terrible. We don't get that many of those, but it's. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking when you do. It's um, you know, there's different criteria for rejection of, of an early ballot. If the if the unvoted ones don't come back as one, if the form isn't filled out as another. If it's not signed, that's another. If there's anything on the ballot. I have to sign this? The, it's not anonymous? Uh, no, the ballot itself is anonymous. But you the, have to sign when you send it back. You know, this is for me. This is my ballot. I sign it away. And it's then, you know, we open them up and we run them through. And we don't know whose is whose. But that way we can check your ballot. You know, we check it in when it's signature. requested. We check it in when we issue it, and we check it in when we receive it back. So that loop is closed. But after that, um, the only thing that would get your ballot rejected would be, and I, I had one of these today, it's the first one I've ever had, where on someone's ballot they signed their name. You can't identify yourself on the ballot. When I send this in, uh, what is ballot harvesting? Oh, I mean, that's a catch-all term that folks who are uh, opposed to the, I, the concept of mail-in elections have thrown out there. If, you know, they use it in various ways. You know, somebody trying to collect ballots meant for other people, uh, put in requests for ballots on behalf of other people that they would then try to capture. You also hear it um, in the context of, you know, a political candidate or a political party. You know, looking they don't to, have ballot harvesting in Vermont. No, there's, there's nothing going on. Um, like I say, that term means different things to different people anyway. Okay, I'm going to send this in to you, and it's going to go in a stack along with a mess of others mm -hmm. for election night, right? Yes, although one of the changes we have now um, in that special dispensation to allow the Secretary of State authority to make quick needed changes to the election process is that we now, under very strict um, chain of, of um, what am I trying to think, chain of possession, chain of whatever, uh, the word escapes me today, I'm under-caffeinated, um, uh, we can start running those through, we can activate one of our tabulators that we keep in our vault, and we can start running through those early ballots as early as now. So we've actually started running those through. That way we're not... But nobody's watching the tally. There, there will not be a tally until election night. We have to match up at the end. Right. Oh, you mean the, the total for the candidates? Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that, that doesn't happen until everything's done, when the polls are closed, 7 o'clock on the 11th. Then we shut those things down, and they give us the final tally. The only counts we're watching right now is, are we checking in the same amount as we run through, and is then we then put in the ballot back? Those, that's, that's the uh, verification we're doing right now. So we're seeing a spike in, in terms of the numbers that are returned right now. Um, oh, 
yeah, although I tell you, I'd like to see a lot more returned. We're going to end up with about 3,000 early ballots out there. What, what do we normally do for a August primary? primary you know, seven-something. 7,000? Seven 700-something. Uh, oh, 700. So, and the August primaries in general are usually, the turnout's usually around 24, 2,500. So we're going to have more early ballots out than we have for turnout normally for this election. Um, so, oh. when we when we come to the to the fall, will we actually get the ballot this year? Come fall election, if everything goes the way the secretary Secretary of State is planning, and I have no reason to believe it won't, then you'll you'll get the ballot in the mail. You just will get the ballot, and then everybody will just send it back. So you anticipate that participation in this election, well, being a presidential year. It, has a broader participation anyway, mm -hmm. but you anticipate that this will really be a deluge of mail-in ballots this fall? Well, you know, it's really interesting um, because there's been enough time with these mail-in elections now, you can actually see the results. Um, there was a lot of, of expectation that it would really increase turnout. And it was being done in states like Oregon, Washington, where they're already very high turnout states. So you look at the numbers over the years, and on those you know, general elections, it hasn't really increased turnout that much, a little at best. But what it's done is the intervening elections, the more local elections, the lower turnout elections, it's brought them up to that same level. So you know, general election with the president, huge, right? Town meeting, turnout down here. August primary election, maybe turnout down here. So now when you switch to an all mail in election, you still have the general up here. Town meeting goes up here, August goes up here. They, the variation, it all evens out at that high turnout level. So if we stick with this, and I think we're already starting to see that happen with the August primary because participation is already up before we've even opened the doors on election day for the August primary. I think that's, that's the effect you'll see happen. Is it partisan at all? or uh, In terms of who returns those ballots, sir? Progressives more likely, or Democrats more likely, or Republicans more likely? Well, of course, we have no, no uh, party registration in Vermont. Everybody's an independent, right? But you could look at the number of ballots that come back. I was just about to say, mm -hmm. you know. Of each one. You know, um, I would, I'm going to be surprised um, if that's the case. There are some hardcore voters who always turn out. Um, they're going to vote one way or the other, even if they come out on Election Day. And the spread, you know, Montpelier is um, an overwhelmingly Democratic voting town. So um, you'll, you'll continue to see. I don't think those numbers are going to change. What about much. people in the armed forces or expats who are living abroad? Uh, when do they have to get those ballots back? When, when do they have to be postmarked? Well... It's not a postmark issue in Vermont, which is something of some discussion right now. Right now, unlike a lot of other states, we got to have that ballot back one way or the other by the time polls close on Election Day. So, which means that if the postal, U.S. Postal Service is overwhelmed, it will have an impact on our election. Yeah, it means, and I'll be honest with you because I don't like this, and I, I think I'm in the minority with clerks with this, and... I don't like the idea of giving myself more work. God, do I not. But right now, if you, know, you and some other person both put your ballots in, say, four days before the election, one of yours could theoretically get there in three days, the other one could get there in five days, and only one of them gets counted, even though you both did your due diligence and sent them at the same time. That's... That's not cool. Um, Do I, most states follow that protocol? No, I think most states, I'm not for sure about this, but I think most states are looking at uh, postmarks, which is why you get so much more of a delay on the I final, was just about to ask, yeah. why are 21, why are over 20,000 mail-in ballots still unopened in New York? They, I mean, they have different rules. Sometimes there's, there's you know, challenges with their infrastructure. But uh, I think in New York, the postmark matters. Also, other states still use provisional ballots. We have what are provisional ballots? Provisional ballots were um, something designed um, after the 2000 election debacle. It was part of the election reform, the bipartisan election reform that passed after the, the Gore-Bush election. Um, 
uh, there was a lot of concern about people not being able to vote, about dis disenfranchisement. So provisional ballots were created as sort of a, um, a last resort, a stopgap here. If somebody is feeling they're being disenfranchised, if they're like, no, I should get to vote, I don't care why you've taken me off the list, or why I don't appear on your list, you know, I was purged unfairly, whatever, you could get a provisional ballot in which you vote, you put it in like a special envelope that basically puts it aside later. as, and it's adjudicated later, it's right. And generally the, um, you know, the election administrator can put a recommendation on there, I recommend this one be accepted or, or this not. But then they get counted, they get adjudicated later and they get counted after the fact. So that can really matter doesn't matter if somebody wins by 10%. It can matter it if you're down if you're to a few hundred votes. Francis. Right, so that's, that's why you, um, you'll have these scenarios in other states where, you know, like the Elliott Engel election, where we didn't know for two, uh, you know, speaking of New York, we didn't know for two weeks who won because, you know, early ballots still coming in, provisional ballots that need to be counted. Now in Vermont, we have basically done away with provisional ballots. It's still on the books. So what happens if I do have a challenge? If, if, if I believe I should be able to vote, you know, do you sit with your staff and work with it on the spot on election day? Well, um, yes, we do. Actually, the Board of Civil Authority has ultimate say. And if it's something sort of easy and paperworky, the, the Board of Civil Authority may make a decision. But if not, if it's unclear, you can still get a provisional ballot. It's not unheard of that provisional ballots are cast in Vermont. It's just that the system is now, I think, robust and open and consistent enough that the need just doesn't arise. With all these absentee ballots or mail-in ballots, whatever you want to call them. Early ballots. That's or fine. early ballots. <laughs> will we have the results at about 8 o'clock on election night or 7.30 as, a, as we always do? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. That's the next big piece of un unknown territory we're in, um, we're supposed to. But we could be up a very, very long time if of these 3,000 ballots, of these 3,000 requests that are gonna be out, if 1,500 of them don't show up until election day, it's gonna be a while before we can get them all through, even if we're up all night. So I think there's a little unknown territory here. It's been very unclear how the workflow is gonna go with you know, switching to a virtually all mail. So you're going to stare at the camera and say, please return this quickly uh, before the election day? <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> it's, been, it's been really difficult. We, um, I mean, we, we've got a fair amount of volunteers who have been coming in to help out, and it's been feast or famine for them. Either they come in and we have a ton for them to do, or they, they come in and we don't have much for them to do. And if we could get... So we're looking for that consistent return. You know, we had one day where two you know, um, post office, you know, pallety things got brought in and we're like, oh, look at all these ballots. It begins. And the next day we had like that many. It's very hard Let's to Let's go live. For. You're at City Hall. It's election day. We, we're all wearing masks mm -hmm. and the like. Um, do you have enough volunteers? They're, they're normally people my age who are kind of leery about sitting and facing that many people in the public. Well, we're going to do things really differently. Um, there's going to be, you can't come into City Hall without a mask. We will have masks available for people, and we will be prepared in case there's someone who's like, I want to vote, but I refuse to put on a mask. You know, we can get a couple election officials to bring them out a ballot, you know, right there or to the car. Curbside. Curbside voting. Exactly. I mean, we'll be prepared for that. But you'll come in one part of the building, unless you need the accessibility entrance in the back, in which case you come and go in the back. Um, We'll be voting because we expect far fewer people. We will be voting downstairs in the um, council chambers the way we used to. So this, it's got a door towards the front end of the building. It's got a door towards the back end of the building. So people will come in socially distanced with masks. There'll be a table at some distance set back checking, checking them in. They'll be let in, I believe, six people at a time is how we're going to do it. And then each voting booth will then be sprayed down by another volunteer as they leave then more people can trickle in, and then they'll go so out the back door. you're saying that the morning before work will be hell? Um, with six people coming in and at a time? That well, six people being allowed in. Right, right being allowed in. And with social distancing. 
It I'm could thinking be. more the general election than August when it's a bit colder. See, I don't think so because we're also going to have a drop box out front. Now, come the general election, everybody's going to have that ballot. So the only ones who are going to be coming in are going to be people who are like, I brought my ballot with me, in which case we'll have a drop box. They don't even have to come in. Um, or I lost my ballot and I, want, I need another one, I want to vote, in which case you sign an affidavit swearing, swearing that you actually lost it. We check in the machine and make sure we haven't checked in a ballot for you. And then you can give in one and vote there. But those are going to be the only people coming in on uh, Election Day in November. So it should be, it should be pretty dead. Theoretically. Uh, let me ask a couple of national questions. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the big hoopla over mail-in balloting anyway? It People are concerned um, that of, of the increased opportunity for fraud. What is the increased opportunity for fraud from their perspective? Somehow intercepting a ballot. Um, or as you as it's mailed. As it's mailed on the way back, you know, taking it from a mailbox putting it out of a mailbox, sending out Isn't there a false. signature that has to match? Uh, we don't do matching signatures in Vermont, um, but we're also very small, and uh, we have a pretty good idea of where everybody is, small communities. Um, the concern is that, you know, somebody could find out somebody dead who's still on the rolls and somehow order a ballot on their behalf. This kind of stuff, you know, voter fraud is not unheard of. It's but it's just, static in the system. It's just very rarely heard of. And when you do hear about it, it's, there's a couple ways. It's somebody often trying to test the system and prove that they can cheat the system. And we hear about it because they catch all those people, and those people get busted and they get in a lot of trouble. Um, so, okay, that's one kind of fraud. The other is more large scale, like you had in the congressional election in um, uh, North Carolina a couple years ago, and there was another recent one that escapes me right now, where you had a candidate who had operative actually going out, filling out false requests for people and, 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 inter and interfering with their, their ballot reception, you know, something like that on the macro level, you're going to get busted. But those are the only kinds of things, and they basically, people either get caught, and in that case, they held a new election, or these little ones that pop up so rarely that the result is negligible. And I, you know, I want to say, it's part of my job to be worried about voter fraud. It's part of my job to be worried about voter fraud. It's part of my job to be worried about voter participation. Right now, the scale of those problems are way over here. We so need participation. Anyway, fraud almost non-exists. If that ever changes, you start seeing more fraud, you're going to see me and a lot of other cl clerks flip to that other side, and we will be pounding the tables about doing something about voter fraud. But the truth is, it's just not happening. Right is there any way possible? that a third nation party could hack into the system in Vermont? Oh, that's a very big conversation. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to be presenting at um, uh, DEF CON, the biggest uh, international hacker conference, which is every year in Las Vegas. I presented at it last year. Now it's virtual, and I'll be talking about just that kind of thing, because I'm also a, a certified ethical hacker, and I've been a network admin in various contexts. Is it possible? Um, in Vermont. In Vermont? It just seems like, how do you convey this to Secretary of State's office? Well, the Secretary of State's done a pretty good job with uh, election security. It was something when uh, Secretary Condos was the, the head of the National Association of Secretaries of State, it was a big priority of his. Uh, you'd never say when you're in you know, penetration testing, like I have been, you never ever say something's unhackable. And that's not just... But it's extremely low probability that the count that goes in down the street is, doesn't match the count that's coming in from Wyndham County, from the towns of Wyndham County or the towns of Orleans County? Well, here's what I tell people about that. Nothing can ever be 100% guaranteed as unhackable. So you take steps. You have backups. You have redundancies. You have chain of custody. If you do everything right then an election hack is not a problem. It, I, in fact, I tell people it's the modern version of, of the old classic problem that you have where the, suddenly the election final results are thrown into question because some clerk found five boxes of right. early ballots they didn't, they didn't count, right? 
And we're like, oh God, we got to go through the process. We got to have our, our mechanisms that take care of things step in. And, and then we error. get the, and yeah, and then we get the final result, but we get it two or three weeks later. If we're doing everything right, everything we're supposed to do, and we're doing a pretty good job of that in Vermont, that is the worst case scenario. There's a hack, there's an issue. We go through all our backup systems and we just get the final result delayed two or three weeks. And we, it, it'll still be a result we can count on, but it's the modern version of, oh, we gotta wait two or three weeks because somebody left some ballots in the vault. Congress is looking for more money for elections to make this election mm -hmm. cycle smoother. What would more money mean in Vermont? What, what, what would that be spent on? Well, we're in a really good place right now because the money that has been allotted, and you know, a large amount has been, um, just, you know, we're at a good position for a couple of reasons. One is just that a little goes a long way in Little Vermont, right? Um, we, and, so, and these machines last for years. Yeah, we're using, you know, machines that are 30-year-old tech, and I wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. Why? Um, they are incredibly difficult to hack, and the technology is incredibly um, established. You run samples mm -hmm. of before you do the election. Yeah, we run test runs through to, to on all the different machines to make sure that they're counting correctly. Um, and uh, no, this stuff is great. When I tell you, when I was at the DEF CON voting village last year, and you had a whole room with all different kinds of voting machines spread out, and hackers getting into them, taking them apart, you know, getting into you know, everything, the software, the firmware, and we had some of the ones that we use, um, these, these optical scanners, were there, and people were getting into them, and you know, I'm playing around with them, and the other hackers who are much better than me are playing around with them, and they're saying, oh, well, you could do this, or you could get into the chip here. And you know, we're all talking about ways we would, we would if we had the chance, but to a person, I said, you know, but I would rather have these machines far and away than well, you any have a, other you machine You have a piece of paper that you can audit against. Well, even the other ones that produce paper backup, and paper backup is the gold standard, right? Even the other machines that produce paper backup, I would rather have one of ours than any of the others in that room. And to a person, every hacker I talked to agreed. So. so the election system from your perspective, your studied perspective, because you've been at this for 10 years, are nearly 10 years, and Vermont is sound. I think it's pretty sound. Oh, one final note, get out and vote for that August primary. It's important, democracy is important. When you get that ballot for November, return that ballot well ahead of time. There you go, by the time people hear this, the way we're going, everybody will have probably already voted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you.